All right, welcome everybody to another episode of the Remodelers on the Rise. I'm emphasizing rise, and I'll tell you why in a second. But it's the Remodelers on the Rise show. Um, Houston, have you ever listened to the Remodelers on the Rise show? I have. How many episodes? There's been 261. Have you listened to all of them? I have not. Probably about 30. Wow. So you've heard my voice quite a bit. Yes, sir. And if you were to and if you were to uh, to describe uh, describe my my voice. The, my my tone and my approach uh, in a few words, what comes to mind? I would say someone introducing the Star Wars movie. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, I like that. That means I'm, that means that there's energy there, excitement there. It, yes. All right, I'll take that. I'm chatting with uh, with Houston Trim, and he is in Asheville, North Carolina, and the business is Innovex, I N N O V E X, Innovex Renovations. Where does Innovex come from? Tell us about that. So Innovex came from uh, me, my wife, and my oldest son were thinking about business names, and and I always have enjoyed bringing innovation to our projects hmm. as well as excellence and quality and craftsmanship. Do you share that with uh, with clients? Does anybody ever ask about the business name? Every now and then, I'll have a client that'll ask, and um, generally, yeah, it it's always taken very well. Yeah. And, and I don't, you know, if I went on your website, like the about page to explain that, boom, that's a quick story. And it's already speaking to something being kind of different there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it talks about family a little bit. Uh, it's a great little story. You should share that more often. Thank you. Love it. Love it. Cool. So Innovex uh, Renovations and Houston and I um, have, he's listened to me talk a lot. I've only listened to him talk for a few minutes here. We were just getting to know each other before we clicked the uh, record button. Um, he is, I, I know one thing, he's an adventurer. He may have a busted up thumb because uh, while I was, actually, you know what I was doing Saturday afternoon? I had a long week. I, I did a VIP club event and, and three days of that I was wore out. I was napping on Saturday afternoon. Houston, what were, what were you doing on Saturday? On Saturday, I decided uh, after a month off the mountain bike to join in a three hour mountain bike race hmm. and resulted six miles into a crash and dislocated thumb. That you popped back in, but we won't, we won't share the gruesome details like you did before we click the record button. Yes. And here you are on Tuesday, already back in the saddle. You got a little, you got a little splint on there, and mm -hmm. and uh, and you're ready to rock. Correct. Cool. Way to go. So the reason I was emphasizing the rise part is something that I have been wanting to do a little bit more of is have guests on the show that just really explain kind of where they were compared to where they are today. And, and usually, and what we're going to see today is kind of, you know, a business that even three years ago was doing $300,000 of revenue with one part-time employee three years ago to today, or even a few months ago when you wrote this, um, on track for a million and a half in revenue, really solid gross and net profit. And how in the world did we go from, you know, 300K of revenue up to five times that revenue wise with solid profits in the span of just a handful of years? What were some of the key things that allowed you to be a remodeler on the rise? And um, Houston is part of uh, the remodelers community. It's a private Facebook group. And he posted um, just kind of out of the blue a few months back of just, hey, here's some of the things that I have done that have been really impactful and helpful, things I've learned on the podcast, things you've learned from other fellow Remodelers on the Rise folks, et cetera. So we kind of wanted to to kind of unpack that. So if you could just introduce yourself a little bit about kind of who, who you are and then, uh, and then and then kind of jump us into, you know, where things were three years ago and kind of what you were what you were experiencing then. So. I am a, a re renovation contractor in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I am a father of five kids, um, got a lovely wife at home um, that has her own business. Um, and I used to be a competitive speed skater and bike racer. Um, and so that, that's, a, that's about it. I like that. I mean, that's, that's, a full, that's a full load right there. Mm-hmm. Could have start, you could have stopped after the five, uh, the five kids plus the wife, and she has her own job. Uh, what do you do in your free time? What part of five kids and a wife with also a business don't you understand? We're busy with just that, right? So, yeah, so, so three, my, go ahead, go ahead, please. So, in my free time, I enjoy riding my bike, uh, road bicycle with friends, uh, generally in a training atmosphere for racing as the adrenaline 
of racing is what draws me to be an athlete, um, as well as when we get the chance to my wife and I to, to hang out in downtown Asheville and go to dinner um, and, and try to get to enjoy those little moments that we have outside of soccer practices and ah, yes. work schedules. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So, so uh, three years ago, you're around three hundred thousand dollars of revenue. Um, you know, describe kind of what the, how things were going uh, at that point. So that was uh, the year of the pandemic. Uh, we came into um, obviously the world trying to shut down around us. Um, our clients asking, "Are you planning on working?" You know, and as our answer was, "As long as the building supply companies don't shut down, we'll continue to work." Mm -hmm. um a little bit modified and what that did is some of the larger companies in our area were shutting down um you know they had projects with multiple subcontractors people were sick things like that so they weren't able to take on the let's say normal amount of work they would have taken in 2019 hmm. and with this i had stopped training competitively um i used to train about 20 to 24 hours a week as a competitive wow. athlete. And so I converted that over into working for the company 24 hours. Um, and so with that, because we, we operated doing the work in house, it limited the interactions that were between our employees and our clients. So that allowed us to take on projects to continue projects that otherwise would have been halted by bringing in you know, a demo crew, a drywall crew, you know, framing all of those sub trades because we have to, most of our clients, um, as we have specialized in live-in renovations, um, are, weren't comfortable bringing those people in. You said live-in renovations? Live-in renovations, yes. Mm. And so, you know, we, we use zip wall systems, uh, HEPA air cleaners, you know, exhaust fans, HEPA vacuum cleaners, um, things like that. So, as 2020 progressed, um, the first part of the year working outside of the projects that we had already had, we started to get more interest in clients that weren't, that did not want to leave their projects. Um, they didn't want to move. They didn't want to go and travel. So we started to be attracted to more of the high rise community in downtown mm. Asheville. And with that became multiple challenges. Um, and those challenges um, equally in our business, if if you can estimate properly, cost money. Um, and so that kind of led us into a new era of renovations in our area. Gotcha. And if I'm if I'm reading between the lines, you know, that new opportunity. One one interesting thing, you know, you, you really focused in on job site cleanliness, on uh, the ability for people to still stay in their home during the project. That was a good differentiator for you. And then if I'm reading a little bit between the lines on what you just said of, you know, it opened up a new set of challenges, including the challenge of estimating properly on these projects that have a unique sit situation. I'm guessing you said that not because you came out the shoot and knew exactly how to estimate it, and all of your job costing was beautiful, I'm guessing there were some lessons learned there. Correct, yes. Hmm. Um, we, we took on one project that was a flood from a fire sprinkler on the 13th floor of a building. Um, we were recommended to a client that I rode bicycles with that owned a condo that was flooded out. And they had interviewed contractor after contractor, and the contractors didn't know how to manage the process. They didn't know how to work with elevators and cleaning mm. corridors. They were not willing to provide those services, but the building required it. And so after interviewing with that client, um, figuring out that all of the challenges that, that they faced, we could meet in house. And once we were able to do that, we, I said, I went and sat with all the people that were over the projects. Um, listen, I want to hear what's the hardest part. Is it, elevator maintenance is this where and i and i asked what's the constraints with other contractors they were like cleanliness you know making sure elevator pads things like that and so by hearing those things from those higher ups really told me okay it's not a remodel project solely it's also a management pro project for the building so in in the project you had two different facets of the project 
you know, how do you move materials to a 13th floor while they're trying to rebuild eight other floors, hmm. you know? And so that came down to minutes, you know, estimating minutes. How many minutes does it take you to go from the 13th or 14th floor back down to the ground, get something out of the truck, go back up the elevator. Meanwhile, you make four stops, hmm. you know, for other so did, people. So did all of that really apply pressure against, okay, I've got to go from, yeah, I estimate projects to, I need to really get detailed in my estimating. I need to really be paying attention to my job costing to compare my expected hours versus actual that that allowed you or pushed you to really step your game up there? Yes. Yeah, so um, I was always good at, at line iteming uh, projects. Mm -hmm. You know, I can I can write out a detailed scope of work every which way, you know, but what it challenged me in was how much actual time, like you said, on the job costing side, does it take to do these things? So it really challenged me and my staff into how many trips do we go down? And what do we invest in process wise that's going to make the project go smoother, you know, less trips up the elevator, things like that. And that's really if, if you from the front end, what I learned is that if you estimate your trips according to how people actually operate. And then you take their normal operation and you bring in three systems to make sure that it is more efficient, then there's a chance there to make extra money based off of being efficient in Some how privilege. you operate. Correct. Excellent. Excellent. So <clears throat> I'm hearing some of what is allowing you to, to grow uh, in revenue, revenue wise. But what I want to kind of do is just, we want to capture some of these best practices or things that mm -hmm. you've implemented. So the first one I've heard here is related to um, differentiation. That's a, that's an important one of, of being unique and see, seeing an opportunity and really digging in and seizing it. And then the second Correct. thing is related to, you know, I started taking part of what helped me go from 300,000 and a part-time employee well into the million dollars with solid net profit is I also stepped up my game with estimating. I realized that there's grippage to be had if we're, if we're efficient and productive. We're really going to be reasonable and realistic with the amount of time that each task is going to be taking and we pay attention to it and we watch it, the expected versus actual. You see that the estimating side as a key facet in your in your growth? I do, I Good. do. I, I feel like um, jobs are, are lost in one via the estimating. Yeah. But not only that, the job can be lost, so can our life, basically. Mm -hmm. um, we have all lost money getting to where we are. Um, yep. I, I tell people all the time, if it wasn't for 20 years of losing money, I wouldn't have the knowledge that I have today. Um, but so what, is, that, is that why we call it the school of hard knocks? <laughs> it's it, kind it of it, right? It definitely is. Um, yeah. You know, and, and another thing, and in, in we implemented um, job tread. You know, I had I'd been estimating via Excel spreadsheets forever. Um, I had taught myself how to create them. Um, I worked for a commercial company as an estimator who taught me the the reason why you have markup, um, what that does. And so that taught me a lot. And, and we had attempted builder trend, um, to manage some of the things, but it was, it was a little bit cumbersome if you didn't have time. Um, but I had, um, found job tread on a weekend that I was struggling to invoice a hundred thousand in work. And over that weekend I had estimated, I think in about four hours, I had done a $60,000 bathroom hmm. estimate broken down. I mean, in detail, you know, as well as being able to also invoice about 80,000 that same weekend. Um, and that was, you know, having that estimating tool, you know, I would say is probably been one of the lead determiners in where we're at today is based on something that has been able to, to give us something to replicate mm, our estimates. And speed that back. process up. Yeah, to look back. Okay, what did we do at this project? You know, how many days did we figure that it was going to take versus how many did, what did we charge for elevator pads, corridor and cleaning? See, and being things. able to see your job costing, the estimated versus actual, that's a Correct. big part of it. Cool. Yes. So let me, let me pause there, just emphasis for emphasis sake. We're, we're listening to a remodeler on the rise over the course of three plus years has made his business five times revenue wise and probably five, if not more times uh, profit wise. And you're hearing uh, a few things so far. Uh, this the second one that we're hitting on estimating and then also we're coupling in it 
uh, related to job costing. And you know, you're, you're mentioning job tread as a way that you've really streamlined that. If I could move on to, to a third thing that's helped you mm -hmm. kind of grow, um, it sounds like the way that you have looked at what you're charging, your pricing, your markup and margin, um, you've made, you made a, a shift in that as these years have come along. So what, what did you experience or learn related to the pricing of your work? So um, pricing is a, is a unique thing. We all hear our electricians, and, and this was probably some of it. My electrician raised their rates from $150 an hour for two guys to $175 an hour. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is I was charging $150 an hour for two guys. Well, mm -hmm. when I added a third guy, I never changed my price. I Oops. added it up in my head, thought we're covered. The work will get done faster, yada, yada, yada. So, but what I was not realizing is that when you add that person, you have to increase price. You know, you, in order to have the, the ability to teach and things like that, financially, it's an investment bringing another employee but also for the company, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to grow with that employee, to bring that. And so we raised our rates. Um, I went up to $185 an hour, which okay. from 155, which was a small increase, but it was enough to make that difference. Of and you, that and you mentioned electrician. Are, are you talking just in, in, was that related to a trade partner or was that also but, applied to the carpenter side or what? It was a, so or are that you doing was a, a lot trade, of electrical work. So that was a trade partner that we work solely with on all of okay. our remodels. Um, and so it showed me when they raised their prices that things are becoming more, you yes. know, the pay rates that we're paying are higher, you know, but I failed to go in and say, okay, these guys are making more money. We've got to raise our prices. So until he came to me and said, Hey, just so you know, we'll do these last couple jobs at the prices we've quoted, but future jobs are going to be built at a, in a different rate. And from the estimating portion, what I try to do is know what my electricians charge, my plumbers sure. charge. So when I'm line iteming my estimates, I'm using numbers that they would use. Yes. Um, you know, and, they're, then, and then on the, on the carpentry work or even on your materials or, or vice versa, did you also just increase your overall markup? margin so we so we switched so up until 2021 i worked off markup okay. um and there's a book that you talk about profits and margins um i forget the exact markup title. And profit. It in yeah markup and profit um sure. so I, I began reading that bu book to better help me understand where business costs are and then when i started with job tread they have a in theirs is considered margin yes um so that's when i started to learn okay basing my projects off margin instead of markup um, was getting me closer to where we should have been. Um, and, where, and where were you? And then where have you kind of shifted to margin so, wise? So we were originally estimating at 20% markup, um, which in, uh, in relation to margin, I don't have that written down. 17% margin. Okay. So we moved to a 35% margin. Woo. Woo. Um, <laughs> Okay. So you were talking, you were uh, talking about, you were talking about the electrician and that's, and that's fine. And that's an aspect of it, making sure you know what your actual cost is, but now we're getting correct. into the heart of the matter. You have correct. gone from a 20% mark up, which is the equivalent of a 17% margin mm -hmm. up to a 35% margin. That's the equivalent of a 54% markup. Correct. Coupled with that, you've improved your estimating so that you made sure that you're covering things. Coupled with that, you've been paying attention to your job costing, which has allowed you to hold on to that margin <clears throat> and not have a lot of slippage. But that, to me, is probably the biggest dial that you changed is we were not charging enough. Where is the money at? Why do I not have more in my bank account? And as you started to adjust these dials, I can only imagine that if you're up at that 35% margin and you're holding on to it, that that is just an absolute transformation of your financials. Yes. And I've listened to you say that if you're going to be, if you want to do a million dollars in work, you've got to have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank, yeah. you know, the 10% yeah. kind of thing. And that's kind of where we've looked at it is like, 
in order to ensure employee payroll, insurance payments, the cash flow needed for the jobs, things like that. That that's a it it puts us into a a more comfortable space to take care of our clients. Yes. To ensure that any problem that they have is addressed immediately. Things like that. When in 2020 we did 40 jobs, you know, or something like that. It was roughly in the high 30s. We weren't making much money and there wasn't much time to go back yeah. and settle issues. Um, not only we were also dealing with COVID. So now we're doing uh, about six or eight projects a year, mm. but our clients are getting top level service. You know, their gotcha. every concern is taken care of. So your, your average job cost has gone way up into that mid six, mid to upper, um, you know, 150, 180 a, a project. Okay, good. Correct. And, and so the quality of the level of projects, but also what, what allowed you to go from a 17% margin, 20% markup to a 35% margin, 54% markup, perhaps the quality of the work and the clients, but was it mostly just a mindset shift of realizing I need to charge more in order to deliver at that level of service that I want and to make the money that I, that I should and want to make, um, is, is it a lot of just mindset shift and a little yeah. getting rid of head trash? I, I would say you, you hit it, it, it the nail on the head, you know, yeah. mindset, head trash, you know, we've been providing quality. I've told my guys, we're going to deliver at the highest quality that we can achieve regardless of the job cost, mm -hmm. because, you know, painter once told me and many people have quality first money second, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if you deliver on the quality, you know, my dad operated a business, everything was word of mouth, you know? And so really that, I mean, it's selling it. You know, when but you go but to delivering job, on the quality of 35% margin where there's actually money to do it versus delivering on the quality and going, all right, we're just going to eat this one. Yeah. And there's not enough money for this. I can't hire this person. I can't invest in that marketing. Um, it's a lot more fun to deliver on that when there's also the gross profit sitting there to really make sure we're doing it proper. That's exactly true. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So that was, that was, uh, I'll, I'll call that the fourth one. Cause I'm, I'm counting job costing as the third one. So that was the fourth okay. one is you change the way that you were pricing. And if, if I'm a remodeler listening to this going, okay, I'm working hard. We deliver a great experience as well. You've heard, you know, specialize, you've heard estimating focus, you've heard job costing focus of expected versus actual. And he transformed the way that he was going about pricing his work. He changed his mindset on that. He, he built up his, his salesmanship to be confident in it. And he went out there and got the signed contracts. You were, you were a steal before. You were providing a high level of service and you were dirt cheap. And some mm -hmm. people need to hear that because that's where they're at. Stop yeah. being the best deal in town and make sure that you're charging a rate that's going to allow you to, to be profitable to for all of the risk and the work you're doing to have some reward at the end of it. You can do it. So uh, let me go for the fifth one. Some very practical ones. You mentioned setting deadlines being a very helpful thing uh, in your continued growth, maybe even in your in your in your reduction of stress and, and that side of things. Um, what comes to mind as far as it's kind of setting deadlines and how has that helped you? So before, you know, we would we would go look at a project and and we may not think about it for a few weeks um, after we've done it. You know, yeah. now setting a deadline, you know, telling people I'll get back with you in three weeks. You know, most of our projects are quite intricate. Um, they have a lot of levels of complexity work, you know, that need to be arranged with designers, things like that. So just letting somebody know, you know, we operate at one year, anywhere from 12 to 18 months outside wow. of a schedule range. So, you know, first off telling people, we're a year out, you know, and then that you gauge your interaction from that. And, mm -hmm. and when they're okay with that, then we said, okay, I will follow up with you in one month. We'll come up with a, a plan for what's next, such as getting them with a designer to help them make their selections, uh, things like that. But also setting up, you know, a deadline for project completion, you know, laying out a Gantt chart within job tread. So the guys can see, okay, We've got four days on this, you know, because we, we all inevitably, we may make up a day here, but because we're doing work in house, you know, oftentimes things overlap. 
well, if we set an end, end goal and I've laid out an entire calendar for my guys, then they can better see, okay, we're getting within 10 days of that deadline, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. And A really what gets to- measured gets improved, right? Correct. Correct. And so, you know, that, that's kind of why we've set deadlines because it's really hard to put somebody on the schedule for March. If you don't even know if what you're doing from January to March can be completed. Yeah. So a few things that you had written was, um, you know, I set, I set appointments before I get off the phone the majority of the time. And that's something you're, you're trying to improve and to push really to make it happen. You know, part of that is when we say, I'll get back to you next week, I'll get back to the end of next week. Those are very bad things for you to say out of your mouth. I hey, let's set up a meeting um, for next thir- next Thursday at two o'clock so that I have this updated estimate completed for you. Let's book the the meeting for me to come back when we are when we are busy and we're not setting the next meeting before we ended the first one. Uh, that leads to things just lingering and lingering. I yeah. told him I was going to get back to him at the end of this week. Here I am mid the following week. This is not the way I want to operate. So setting appointment appointments and getting those deadlines, what you're describing of, of working hard to, especially near the end of a project, to give them a completion date, making sure my team sees some completion goals of when we're trying to finish this project. So I, I, you, you had highlighted just that idea of being a lot more deadline driven, making sure mm-hmm. that that next meeting is booked. And it's just helped you kind of reduce your stress and, and also what I call reduce your cycle time, the amount of time, you know, from the time maybe, you know, the first appointment happens to the, when the design is done or when the design agreement right. is signed to et cetera. So that's a good, that's a good reminder and a good, good lesson for everybody listening, uh, listening to this. Any other comments on that one? Um, I would say, uh, you know, you, you've mentioned, you know, final 5% on many occasions. And that comes back to that deadline as well. Um, You know, making sure that at the end, you know, I have guys that'll say, I don't know why we're repairing this. It looks fine. And I said, did you repair something? And they're like, yes. (laughs) I said, then it is not at our quality, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that comes into that. You know, if if you've got that deadline set up, then you can figure out where the final 5% also lands. You know, does that land once the client begins using the space, you know, and they can provide a punch list, um, things that they see that, that may have been overlooked. Um, and, and if you, if you finish two weeks late and you never had that day, then you feel like that final 5% was given in those final two weeks yeah, yeah. instead of so actually you, being set up. Yeah. If you're on, if you're on your remodelers on the rise podcast app or whatnot, if you just search the final 5%, we've got a couple uh, kind of a part one and a part two of uh, what what he's kind of talking about in more depth of the importance of the final 5%. So, so you know, we're talking about things here that have allowed you to go from, you know, stressed out, not making a lot of money, low, low revenue to where you are um, today. I'm going to, I want to hit on a couple, a couple more here, but before I do that, are you having more fun in your business these days than you were a few years ago? And if so, why? I am. We are getting to do the projects that we enjoy doing um, that have hmm. very creative details, um, you know, are, uh, yeah, are just much more fun. Our clients are ec- so ecstatic to have the projects done. Um, and so it, it really helps me to love my job. I hmm. mean, I am a remodeling contractor because I have tried a lot of things out there and I love the complexity, the challenges, but overall at the end, when the client is so happy with their project, I mean, that right there is what it drives the boat on down the Mm. water. Isn't it, isn't it kind of more enjoyable when the bank account is healthier too? (laughs) It, uh, you can go to sleep at night when there's money. Yeah, that whole sleep thing. That whole sleep thing. Um, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned eat the frog being another thing that's helped you kind of improve. Um, and what I, I'll just read what you wrote there. Uh, first, the, the eat your frog is what is the most important thing you need to get done that you're most likely to put off? And what you wrote there is, hey, that quote, that estimate that you're worried about, it won't create itself. That meeting that you don't want to set, that client that is in severe pain and continues to call, handle them first and get that off your plate. Remember, the frog eaten in the morning is one you won't worry about the rest of the day. The one you must eat before bed may encroach boundaries, you also wrote. Um, so that analogy, that little lesson is something that you've taken to heart and been really after. Yes. Um, you know, 
from the time that I heard it, I, I have talked to my wife about it because sometimes we need other people to also tell us. And yeah. so she'll hear me say, oh, I've got to get this done or, or something like that. And, and we'll wake up in the morning and she'll say, what's your frog today? You know, what, oh, I love what do you need I already, to do? I already and, love her. I love her already. <laughs> yeah. And, and we've, we've used it both in, in both of our businesses, but it's a huge thing. And it, it's something that as business owners, guys that can work with our hands, we almost need to say it out loud to ourselves first thing in the morning. Yeah. Um, yeah. Be- or you can just rib it, just rib it, rib it, <laughs> rib it. Uh, my, my son yesterday, we were going through kind of his, some priorities. He just got some schoolwork and this and that. And one of the things on the list is we had a bunch of fo- his folded laundry that he needed to take upstairs to his room. And so I'm like, all right, let's just go through your list of what you need to accomplish. Boom, 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 boom. And there's probably four things on there. And he starts going and grabbing his clothes. And I'm like, is that your frog? Well, what was the frog again? I said, well, you define it. The f- most important thing for me to get done. Ah, yes. Yes, my young buck. And uh, and I said, is that your frog? And he goes, no. I said, what's your frog? This. The frog is usually a thing we really don't want to do. Taking the laundry up is so much easier than going and actually engage in the brain and doing that thing we don't want to do. But what you have found is the more that you eat your frog and get that done, and especially as the business grows and especially as you have more team members, I would argue it's even more important that you as the leader are eating your frogs and also guiding and teaching your team how to do the same because we all have a, a conversation or a task or what whatever the case might be. So I'm glad that that one kind of rang true. And I, I also love that it's kind of not just in your side of things, but in your family. It's a yeah. vernacular now. Correct. Excellent. And then, and one other thing you mentioned as far as uh, kind of being on the rise aspect is you were talking about uh, your website leads and again, being pretty timely with them, making sure that, you know, you're, you're turning those around quickly. You're, you're getting in contact with them quickly. Um, any other comments on that one? Um, I would, yeah, I would just say like, you know, things like that. I mean, it, it all kind of jumps together with that eat the frog. Like we get phone yeah. calls and voicemails, um, you know, other things I've done with that is just try to keep a notebook beside my computer and, and make notes of those things of, as priorities, you know, um, and set the goal that, that hopefully at the end of the day, we have those priorities checked off because mm-hmm. we, we all have so many things going on at, at so much. It, it's just like saying, eat the frog in the morning. I like know, it. It's in anything else that you would point to, is there one other thing that you're like, you know what, the other thing that maybe has been a very integral part besides the things that we talked about, which by the way, are really meaty, important things. The, if, you, if you go back and listen, the job costing, the improving the estimating, the raising your prices, the setting deadlines, the eating your frog, you can see how, you know, have those been the reasons that he's been able to go from where he was in 2020 to where you are today? And is that a hundred percent of the reason? No, but is it 80 plus Mm-mm. percent? Probably, you know, probably. Yeah. So um, is there one other thing that kind of comes to mind as far as what, what has also enabled you to, to rise and grow like this? So I would say, you know, like I said, I was a competitive athlete, you know, and I invested 20 plus hours a week into that, you know, yeah. to be a phenomenal athlete. So when I came to start in you know, and, and I realized my potential 2021, 2022 um, was to, you know, late 2020 was to work for my company. You know, what are my problems? You know, well, I go out and do the work. You know, we go out and set tile, we demo the bathroom, we arrange electricians. But, you know, was I really working for my company in the manner that I needed to be, you know, doing the work at the computer, you know, doing the estimating? looking at things like that. So really taking and saying, you know what, for this many hours a week, I'm going to work for Innovex. Not Innovex as far as demoing and setting the tile, yeah, but, but Innovex the is the, the backbone, you know, of everything. It, and and I, my drive to, uh, I enjoy having employees who can go home and pay their bills because they work for Innovex. Yeah, excellent. Love it, love it. How'd that podcast go for you there, Houston? Was that fun? It's been great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, if I, if I were to kind of wrap, wrap things up and uh, you can, you can as well um, first mention, uh, mention if somebody wants to fi- find your website or find you on social media, what would you say? 
So you could go to my website, www.innovexrenovations.com, or we prioritize a lot of our posting to Instagram, and we have Innovex Renovations on Instagram as well as Facebook. Rocking. So that's that. And then to, to end things, uh, if if they were to hear nothing else and kind of what you shared and the stories that you shared, um, you know, what would you kind of want to really emphasize to the fellow remodelers who are listening to this? Don't let your mind get in the way of progress, um, mm -hmm. whether that be from the projects that you can take on or the money that you can make and make sure that you are charging for the services that you are providing as as someone that's reputable and provides quality work love it i'm gonna leave it at that couldn't have said it better myself thanks so much houston thank you